This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the best place to build and host your own website. Today I want to talk about how I recreated the opening scene from The Terminator. This shot was a big step up for me in terms of difficulty, whereas for the last video I recreated one shot from Jurassic Park in about 3 weeks, for this video I only had one week and I had to make 8 different shots. So this is how I did it. To begin with I just went through the whole sequence and I broke it down into its individual elements, just trying to figure out exactly what each shot was composed of. I personally split this into 8 different shots but in actuality it was about 9 in the original because there is one hidden cut where it transitions from a shot of a soldier being blown up to like a pile of skulls and some smoke. I just made that all one shot by putting the skulls in the foreground and using a bit of forced perspective. Now luckily for me the original Terminator had a really tiny budget. Whereas most large action movies around this time had a budget somewhere between about 25 and 40 million dollars. Ghostbusters, Temple of Doom, Supergirl, they all had that sort of money to play with, but Terminator was only Jim Cameron's second feature movie as director, so he only had about six million dollars to create the whole thing. He didn't have a lot of money to spend on this opening sequence is what I'm trying to say, and to cover up some of the janky practical effects he used these really strong silhouettes, dark lighting, loads of smoke, lasers and explosions just to try and cover up the fact there wasn't a lot of detail there. That was really good news for me because I could do those exact same tricks and get the same sort of effect. So the first thing I realised by going through this footage is that almost every shot has a bunch of different skulls on the ground. So I do have this old model of a skull that I made somewhere on my PC but I couldn't actually find that so I just downloaded one instead. There's no shortage of models and scans of skulls just freely available on the internet to download. So I created a really basic texture just using a noise generator and a colour ramp node. And then I used the random output of an object info node which gave each different skull copy a different random noise pattern and a slightly different colour. That stops all the skulls from looking like just duplicates of one object even though that's exactly what they are. Since I knew that I was going to need tons of these skulls in some of the shots I decided to use the decimate modifier just to bring down the poly count of the high res version. That way my PC could more easily handle like thousands of skulls on the ground. It's really surprising how much you can decimate a model sometime and not really lose any of the detail. If you look at the high res and the low res version of this skull they look practically identical unless you get really close up. The first shot that I decided to tackle is this sequence where there's a soldier running through some rubble, he's getting fired up by these lasers and then it cuts to another shot where he falls to the ground and it cuts to a load of smoke and some skulls in the foreground. Obviously I was going to need a soldier model for this and I didn't really fancy modelling one from scratch. There isn't a ton of good references online about what the uniforms look like anyway. So I went on to Adobe's free Mixamo tool. They have a library of different characters you can download and they have this SWAT team member. I just changed the textures on him and when you put him in the dark lighting you really couldn't tell the difference. I also use Mixamo for the animations because it has a mocap library as well. I found this one of a soldier running with a gun and I just downloaded that at the right frame rate and put it into Blender as an FBX file. Once I was in Blender I opened up the non-linear action editor and I duplicated the action a bunch of times so that it would just keep repeating the same run cycle. Inside the non-linear action editor you can actually grab the actions and scale them to slow them down or speed them up but I was pretty happy with the speed that it was running in the first place. I downloaded this model of a gun and just modified it slightly so it looked like the gun from the original and then I just manually moved that into place so it looked like he was holding it with his hands. 
To make sure that I followed the position of his hand, I used the child of constraint and I selected the bone from the armature in the hand and that basically just makes the object that is the gun always track the position of the hand bone. Obviously the character is just running on the spot right now which isn't very good when you're running from lasers. So to get him moving along the scene I created a curve object and I used the follow path constraint on the armature so that the character would now run along the length of the curve. You can keyframe the offset position which controls when it goes from the start of the curve to the end of the curve and by changing the curve length and the offset you can change how fast he runs across the scene. If you select the option for follow curve he'll also change his orientation so he's always pointing towards the curve not just running forward straight into space which obviously looks weird when the curve bends. The actual environment was created mostly from a bunch of photogrammetry scans that I downloaded from Sketchfab. These all varied a little bit in quality but once it was in the dark light and you really couldn't tell the difference between the really good scans and the bad ones so it didn't matter too much. There's also a couple of wrecked cars right in the foreground of this shot. I used a really cool little add-on that I like called Traffic to add a VW Beat model into the scene. Then I just had to remove all the glass, give it a rusty paint texture and when it was in the foreground as a silhouette I thought they looked really good. I also went around with a knife tool and I just cut out some little jagged shards around the edge of the door frame to make it look like the glass had been smashed out. I'm not really sure how noticeable that was in the end but it didn't exactly take long and it's a nice little touch. I'll leave a link to the traffic add-on in the description of this video. So for a long time I've wanted to have some sort of website where I could just link to all the resources and things that I mention in these videos without people having to troll through the description of all the videos to find what they want. I finally started building that website this week using the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. If you've never heard of Squarespace before, they're the industry leader in do-it-yourself website creation tools. They have this really nice drag and drop interface where you can quickly build out a professional website even if you've got no experience with web development or with coding. One thing I really like about using Squarespace so far is they make it very easy to build exactly the sort of website that you want. In fact when you first sign up to Squarespace it'll ask you all these questions about exactly the sort of website you're trying to build, is it a portfolio, are you trying to sell things etc and based on the boxes that you select it'll offer up all these nice templates that are fully customizable but it gives you a really nice starting point without you having to make the whole website from scratch. Make sure you visit squarespace.com forward slash decoded to start your free trial and if you use the offer code decoded you'll get 10% off your first website or domain name registration. Okay so for the next part of the sequence a soldier runs around the corner, he gets hit and he dies. Well, no, technically he doesn't get hit. If you watch the original, he just dies, he just falls over. So either way, I had to go back to Mixamo and find an animation of a soldier dying. Then I downloaded that from Mixamo, but without the skin, so I'm downloading just the armature this time. Now re import that into the scene. Since both of these rigs are exactly the same, it's really easy just to transfer an animation from one to the other. So now our soldier has this new animation where he falls to the ground. Then I just had to move all of the elements of the scene back into place to make it look like a new shot. In fact, I used basically all of these elements over and over again in every single shot. There's hardly any other meshes apart from what you see in, in that shot of the soldier running because I found if I move things around enough, scale them about and relight the scene, you really can't tell that it's all just the same assets since it's all just a silhouette anyway. All of the smoke hits were made in Blender with just a really simple smoke simulation. Originally I planned to import the actual volume itself into the scene so it would play out inside the viewport but the problem is I already have this big volume box around the whole scene to make the fog and if you try and put a volume object inside another volume object well Blender just doesn't like that at all. You get all these weird glitches and sometimes you can see the outline of the second volume box inside the first one. It doesn't work very well so the easiest thing to do is to just render out your smoke simulation and then import that render as an image on a plane with an emission shader. You get basically the same effect and it renders much faster as well which is always a nice plus. So to finish off this shot I obviously needed all the laser blasts. I could have done this actually in Blender. I've done a tutorial about this before with Star Wars lasers where you basically just have a cylinder being fired out of a like as in a particle emission and you stick a strong light on it. 
but I found it easier just to use this free plugin for After Effects called Saber. It's made by Video Copilot. It's intended to do lightsabers, but it has all these different laser effects and I think it looks pretty good. So most of the other shots in this sequence feature one of these HK tanks. So naturally that was the next thing I tackled. It wasn't very easy to find good reference pictures. I actually had to use some photographs of toys from the 80s because they changed the design for the second movie, which is what most of the references were coming up as. The tank tracks themselves were actually fairly simple. I just modeled a single tread and I used a curve to mark out the shape of where I wanted the treads to go. And then I used the array modifier and the curve modifier to make sure that those treads would follow the curve all the way around the wheels. If you grab the tread object, and you move it in the X direction, what you'll notice is that all the treads follow around the curve like they're part of a track that's actually moving around. Now obviously I've got four of these tracks and I've got loads of wheels. I didn't want to keyframe the location rotation of each one, so what I did is I made an empty object and I used the transformation constraint to make all of those objects follow the rotation of the empty. So now all I had to do was keyframe the location of the empty object and everything else would just follow along. So the top of the tank was just this really low poly model that I got off the internet. If I had time, I would have loved to remodel this from scratch myself and make a really nice job of it. And I'll admit that it's the worst shot in the sequence, but it was the best I could do with the time I had left. If you were wondering how I did those spinning lights though on the top of the tank, that's actually ridiculously simple. You just make a point lamp and then you make a really low poly cylinder that surrounds it. Give the cylinder a black material, then delete every other side. Now you just need to set two keyframes to spin the cylinder on the z-axis, and you're pretty much done. You can just select the keyframes with Shift and E, and use linear interpolation. And what that'll do is basically extend the animation that you've made between those keyframes along the whole timeline. So even once the marker goes past the last keyframe, it'll just continue on. Now you can just grab the second keyframe and you can move it closer or further away from the first one to change the speed. So next up I worked on this shot where the tank drives over the skull. To destroy the skull I just used the lasso tool and I split the skull into several different chunks. Then I applied rigid body physics to all the different skull pieces and I used another invisible mesh that was just in front of the tank that acted as the collision body so when the tank hit the skull it would all break apart. I also made sure to enable deactivate on start for the skull pieces. That basically just tells Blender, don't put any physics on these objects until they're touched by another physics object. Otherwise, if I didn't do that, the skull would have just instantly fell apart on frame one. So after that, I moved on to this next shot where you've got the tank driving in the background and there's just a close up shot of some skulls. I managed to find this really nice photo scan on Sketchfab of some abandoned buildings and they were absolutely perfect for what I was trying to do for this scene. I thought it looked a little bit silly that the tank seemed to be driving on a perfectly smooth surface. So to fix that, I just opened up the graph editor and I found the Z axis for the main tank part that everything else was keyframed. I just added a subtle noise modifier to the tank so that it would jiggle up and down slightly as it moved along. It just makes it look like the tank's actually driving across a rugged terrain and not kind of just floating through 3D space, which of course it is. So the final shot that I worked on for this is actually the first part of the sequence where there's an aerial HK flying over the terrain and shooting at people. By this point, I was really ridiculously short on time and I was considering just buying a model of a HK online, but none of them were very accurate to the first movie. And then I came across this STL model. STL files, if you've never heard of them before, are made for 3D printing. They aren't really ideal to use in 3D programs because they usually have terrible topology among other problems, but it was good enough for this. I just slapped a few lights on it and it was good. The original animation in the opening shot is kind of weird. I imagine it was probably made either on a stop motion rig or using some fishing wires. Either way, it kind of doesn't move in the way that you would expect an aircraft to move. And it does this especially weird animation at the end where it just kind of flies off. On the other hand, I didn't want to stray too far from the original shot. So I kind of just split the difference and came up with something I thought looked okay, but kind of still had that janky stop motion fail. Also in this shot, just as the HK flies over in the original, there's all this dust that gets blown around in the foreground. 
That's actually something that's very easy to do practically, but it's pretty hard to do in CGI. And at this point, I just needed to get everything done. I did try this quick test where I used smoke and a wind effector, and it looked pretty dumb. I probably could have got it to work, but it would have been way too much time to get it looking decent. So I just added in some pre-made smoke elements that I already had in the foreground, and looking back, I think it looked fine. The rendering for this whole scene was unbelievably fast. I recently upgraded my workstation to two RTX 3090s. I'm planning on making a video about how this thing performs because I've been getting loads of questions about that. But needless to say, using Cycles X and those two graphics cards, it was pretty much just churning through all the frames. I think the average frame took anywhere between 10 and 50 seconds, depending on the shot. Now, considering how harsh the lighting is and the volumetrics in the scene, that's pretty incredible performance, and the optics denoiser did a great job of clearing up any noise that was left. There wasn't much compositing work done for this, I pretty much just exported it with very high contrast, brought the exposure down a little bit, and I added a little bit of extra mist and blur in the background with a mist pass. All in all, I am pretty happy with how this video came out. It's definitely rough around the edges than I would like, I would love to have another week to spend on this thing, but getting eight shots out the door in one week, including making this video by the way, which is like two days of work. I'm pretty happy with that, that's not bad going. Thanks very much for watching this video and thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring it. Remember to go to squarespace.com forward slash decoded and you can save 10% on a domain name or website if you use the code decoded. I'll catch you guys in a few days with another video.